<laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Crystal, so much. That's just such a blessing. And John and all of you guys, my goodness. I tell you, we have the most faithful praise team that I believe I've ever seen anywhere. And they, they're here all the time and just bless our lives. And they're just champions to me. I tell you, it's just amazing. And thank you for your faithfulness. I mean, they were here a lot of times when no one else <laughs> was here. Of course, you weren't allowed to come, but still, they were faithful. And, and uh, Pastor Tanya was my faithful congregation member for about six or seven weeks. You know, I got used to preaching to empty seats out here, really, is what I got used to. It. And it was a little awkward at first, but uh, I kind of pulled through it and uh, had to believe that somebody was out there on the backside of those cameras that needed this from the Lord. And, uh, and, but you do, miss, you, you do miss a congregation. I, I'm sure you're aware of this because I've said it to you, I think, many times that, that preaching is, is, a, is a group activity, really it is. It's not just somebody standing up and, 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 and doing a monologue. It's, it, it, it has feedback, it has, it has spirit to it, it has life, and, and without a congregation, uh, a lot of things, you know, it's just, it's just kind of, let's do this, and you don't have any feedback, and you don't sense, you know, that spirit roving with you and all of that, so you guys are very important in everything that happens in, our, in the messages and in the music and in everything God says to us because he, he really does say it for all of us and to speak to our hearts and to guide us. And it really does matter who's here, you know. <laughs> the Lord has a word for us. I mean, thank goodness and thank the Lord we have the technology and we have the ability, you know, and with the cameras to speak to people that are outside our church building and in all kinds of places. But, uh, but we have to remember still that God says things to us, you know. He is just not a history lesson or a drama lesson or a did you know this about the Bible kind of thing. It is a lesson that God... God blesses our lives and wants to speak to us and say things to us. And we've been in a series, and I started it really before all this pandemic stuff started. And, and I was preaching like one message of it, and the, that message was that everybody hurts. And I'm talking about the series, The Hurt Locker, that this is the last message of. That's why I'm getting to it. But uh, I preached pre pre that message and then all of a sudden pandemic hit. We decided everybody hurt and everybody had things inside of them that they had placed inside of them because they haven't dealt with them. If you don't deal with the pains and hurts that come into your life, they're gonna just stay there. They're not, they're not going away. You, you push them down into what I've described as a hurt locker, could be called a hurt pocket, uh, but it goes there and it just sits there until... Uh, at some point along the way, it, it, you deal with it or, or it gets you, you know, one way or the other. And a lot of the things that we do, a lot of things we say and the way we respond and the way we live our lives have to do with what's in that hurt locker and, what, uh, and, and how that gets dealt with and whether it gets dealt with or not. And so we started back after a series on David, which I completely enjoyed, and it became obvious that we were gonna be in pandemic for some time. I said, well, let me just start back on this. And we looked at the hurt whisperer, and we, we tried to expose how, how, how the devil whispers in our time of pain and hurt to take advantage of us. That when we're, when we're hurting, we're off balance, we're unfocused, uh, we're susceptible to have things said to us or put into us that, that uh, we wouldn't normally consider at all. And he whispers, he takes advantage of every opportunity to just whisper things to us that are not true, that are exaggerations, that, that hurt our lives. And, and so he's our enemy. And anytime anything that is in your spirit or in your heart makes you afraid, you, this, that's him, that's him. Because God doesn't motivate through fear. God doesn't try to talk to you through fear. God doesn't lead you through fear. But the devil surely does, and so if it makes you fearful, hey, it's him. Then we looked at the hurt healer, which, of course, Christ is the hurt healer, and Jesus heals the hurts in our life, but 
You have to bring them to him. Uh, he's not just, you know, you, you have to come clean. You have to come honest. You have to get out in the light and be truthful because God deals in truth. The enemy works in the darkness. Satan is the prince of the darkness. And God is light and God works in light and God works in truth. So you have to bring those things out. And so today, one last thought on this before we, we move on. Um, all of us have generational connections. There's not a person born on the earth that doesn't come here with some generational connections. It might be psychological, it might be emotional, it might be genetic. It may even be some physical traits that you bear of your, your people, your family, your, your group. <laughs> and you bring these into life with you and, and, and they move through life with you. And what I want to deal with today is to look at those things that have been generationally forwarded to us from our families, from our lives, and let's see if we can clean those things up a bit. Because if we don't work at this, then we just pass them on to our children and they pass them to their children and their children. And it seems that many families, most families for some reason stay the same generation to generation to generation to generation. And the things that plagued uh, your grandparents and your great grandparents and your parents now plague you. And then You'll pass them to your children because uh, these are, are just truths that, about humanity that, uh, that we have a legacy, we have a heritage, we wanna leave a legacy. And we want that legacy to be better and to be less painful, yeah. less harmful. We wanna clean out some of that stuff that the devil has worked through our families through the years to destroy things in our family, to, to, uh, to, to create uh, failure and strife and division and all of those kind of horrible things that so often plague our families. So, so, so does the Bible really talk about generational transfer? I mean, pastor, is that something really the Bible talks about that? I've never seen that in the Bible. Well, let's look here in Deuteronomy chapter five at a couple of verses. In Deuteronomy chapter five, uh, the Lord speaks and he's talking to the second generation of, um, of movers into the promised land. You know, the first generation came out, of it, ex, came out of Egypt and in the book of Exodus, God gave them the 10 commandments and gave them all the laws and all the, everything to do with all of the sacrifices, the laws, the holy day, everything, the commandments. And then led them up to the promised land. They sent spies in, decided uh, there's giants in the land. And they turned around and God said, all right, get back out in the desert. And he marched them around out in the desert for 40 more years until everybody that was 21 years older in that generation that turned around died out in the desert. And now their children come to the same conclusion, come to the same spot. And God says, now will you go in? and possess the land. And now Moses is, not, is no longer leading them, but Joshua is leading them. And so God has to tell and inform the new generation the same thing he told the former generation. Because remember, they didn't have text messages and computer images and files and emails and Facebook and all of that. So God had to say the same thing and tell the children the same thing that he said to their parents 40 years ago, and that's the book of Deuteronomy. Deuter means second, and Deuteronomy means the second giving of the law. That's what the book's about. And so in Deuteronomy chapter five, look at what he says to them. You shall not, now this is, he's already told them don't make any idols and don't make any images and so forth. And this just kind of concludes that thought. Verse nine, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands of those 
who love me and keep my commandments. Now, obviously here, the issue is iniquity. Iniquity is a type of sin. And, and I know you've seen, other words, you've seen the word sin, and the word sin is just a big collective word that means missing the mark. It means if I'm an, if I'm an archer and I shoot an arrow at a target and I miss the bullseye, that's, I, I sinned. It doesn't matter whether it's high, low, left, right, wherever it is, if it misses the mark, then that's sin. That's what the word means. And then, of course, you got transgression, and you got, have all kinds of words that are used for sin, but one of the words that is used for sin is the word iniquity. And that's the specific word that's used here. It's the Greek word avon, I mean, Hebrew word avon, and it, and it, and it means like, uh, if, you, if you want to take it in a visual and look, if you had a, a tree, and that tree had been, was being blown by a prevailing wind, and, and just constantly blown that it would, as it grew, it would grow up bent by the wind instead of straight like this. Well, that's what iniquity is. It means to bend or to twist, uh, to take a standard and to bend it or to twist it. And for humans, iniquity refers to the way you grow up in your family. Something's going on in your family. It may be the way they think. Maybe they think wrong, or they act wrong, or they speak wrong, or they operate in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a twisted kind of way. And as a child growing up in a family like that, you begin to pick that up and you grow up in this family with what psychologists call a bent, a crook in your life because of what happens in your family and you pick it up and you grow up that way. So the point is, that's why family systems seem to have the same uh, issues uh, uh, generation after generation after generation after generation because the most powerful people in our lives are our parents, right or wrong. Mm -hmm. They are the most powerful people in our lives. And, and, we, and we all have the tendency to grow up to be like our parents. Mm -hmm. If our parents were righteous, then we grow up straight. If our parents were unrighteous, then we grow up with a bent. So here in Deuteronomy, Jesus, or, or the Lord is saying to the, the, the generations that are going in the promised land uh, that he was going to visit the iniquity of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So obviously what he's saying is, this is a curse that the, that, 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 that the iniquities of the father are the, are the bendings and twistings of the fathers, of, of the generations, of the, of the families you grow up in. And God says, for those who don't want to be with me, for those who don't want to walk with me, for those who hate me, I'm going to basically impose the tendencies of the fathers, which is a curse because remember, they're bent and they're crooked and they're, it's not right and they're not doing right and it's bad and it's misleading. And God says, all right, we're going to visit that tendency of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. That means your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren. God said, it's gonna affect your generations. But then he turned around and he said, but I'm going to show mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. So obviously God says, this will be a blessing on those generations. So in generational uh, life, there are generational curses and there are generational blessings dependent on how, you're, how you grow up in your family and what kind of family you have. And to show you that, 
if you have an outline, you have this information in your outline, but some of you don't have an outline. And so I'm gonna put it up here on the board, and I know you can't really read that probably, it's really tight and close together, but I'm gonna read it for you. Because it's really, all right, to show you the generational connection that we all have with our families, there was a study done that ended in 1906. And this study was done concerning the generations of Jonathan Edwards, who was in the 1700s, probably the most brilliant Puritan preacher that has ever existed. Really, Jonathan Edwards is accredited with, with, with starting much of the Great Awakening on, on this continent and in Europe. And he lived here in America, and he and his wife, Sarah, had 11 children. And so a study was taken where they studied 1,394 of the heirs of Jonathan Edwards to find out how they fared in life. Is there such a thing as a generational blessing and a generational curse? Well, in contrast to that, they took another man of the same generation who lived in New York City. His name is Max Jukes. And they followed 1,200 of Jack's, of Max's ancestors, and said, all right, Max, Max uh, didn't rear his children, really. Max was uh, uh, either drunk or in jail most of the time. He had the infamous title as New York's most shameless drunk. So we have a Puritan preacher and his wife that rear their children in the characteristics of God, in the word of God, in the values of God, and he rears his family that way, and then Jukes really doesn't even rear his family. They just birth in, and then you know he's really not around most of the time. And is there any difference in that? And I just wanna, you know, this, this is the results right here. Look here, Jonathan Edwards' family, out of his generations, 1,394 people. They had one U.S. Vice President, Aaron Burr, who served Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States. One dean of a law school, one dean of a medical school, three U.S. senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 60 doctors, 65 college professors, 75 military officers, 80 public office holders, 100 lawyers, uh, nobody's perfect, um, 100 missionaries and theological professors, and they had 285 college graduates. So taking the, the teaching and the instruction grown up in a family that followed Christ and loved Christ and put Christ in and ministered Christ and taught Christ. This is, these are the generations of that family and I would say that that is indeed a blessed, a blessed family, a blessing. All right, let's look at the other hand. On the other hand, Max Jukes, who had, they followed 1,200 of his generation and they found that Max Jukes produced seven murderers, 60 thieves, 190 public prostitutes, 150 other convicts that spent an average of 13 years in prison, 310 delinquents that never finished school and died in poverty, 300 who died premature deaths, and 440 who were physically wrecked by the addiction to alcohol. And in 1906, it was estimated that Max Duke's legacy cost the state of New York over $12 million dollars. And that would be the equivalent of $100 million in today's value. Now, I would say that that is a curse. That when you don't rear your family to love God, to know God, to be with God, you don't have any values that are put in your family, that your family reflects that and it is a curse. It, and, it, and it's a curse on this earth and a curse on your family. And so God said, look, I'm going to generationally bless those who love me and follow me and I'm going to allow the, uh, the, the values of the fathers of those that hate me to go down to the third and the fourth generation. This is how powerful, this is how powerful generational transfer is. How parents affect their children and the following generations of their life. 
If you look back at your grandparents, your grandparents had a lot more impact on your life than you really realize. If you look forward, you as parents are going to have a tremendous amount of influence on the life of your children and your grandchildren. And you're going to have the power to make that either a positive influence or a negative influence. We have the right to choose. When we have the opportunity to choose what happens to the generations that follow us. Righteousness or sin, health or sickness, blessing or cursing, wealth or poverty, education or ignorance, pleasure or or pain. All of us have a generational connection to those that have come before us and those that come after us, and we are going to leave a legacy for our children and our grandchildren. If you're full of hurt and you're full of pain and a lot of your reactions come from hurt and pain, then you're, gonna, you're passing that on. You're teaching your children and grandchildren how to react that way how to feel that way, and they're watching, and they're being influenced by this. This is what iniquity is. So how do you you heal your hurt, and how do you begin a legacy of blessing? Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to leave my children more messed up than I am. I want to leave my children a legacy where they can start from another place, a better place, with less hurts and, 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 and less bents and, and, and all of that. I'll I just give you one, one illustration from my life personally, and, and this is not, I'm not trying to brag about anything, and y'all know that, but my legacy, my heritage of my family was uh, alcoholism. My family, all of my daddy's family, uh, except for his sisters, his uh, three brothers and him, um, all were alcoholics. They all died in car accidents due to alcohol or from some medical sickness due to alcohol. And all I knew for the first 21 years of my life was a father who was either drunk or sick from being drunk all the time. I didn't have any Christians in my family. I didn't even know a Christian. One day, uh, uh, a young man uh, that I really didn't even know very well, but my mother knew his family invited me to go to church. They had a big homecoming is what it was called. It's like a big dinner on the grounds and all that kind of thing, like a big family reunion at this little country church. Well, it wasn't really so little, but it's country church. And so I went. I was 13 years old. First time. And um, I went in there and I met some other young people and they seemed to like me and I needed to be liked and uh, so I kept going. And finally, after three years, the Lord saved me. I, I, I came to him. I, I understood what I needed to do. I didn't know that and it sounds weird that you could go to church for three years and not know what you needed to do to be saved but, but it, it, just never, it just never came across to me and I never understood that I needed a personal relationship. I thought going to church was good enough. But I, I, I came to the Lord, and at that point in my life, I said to the Lord when I got saved, I said, Lord, I don't want to be like my family. I don't want to have to live with, with, with that issue. And I... I'm giving myself to you and I'm asking that you would change me and that I would not be involved in that and that my life would not be about that. And do you know, that's exactly what he's done. And instead of being a progenitor of the generations that had come before, here I am preaching the gospel, telling men and women how to be saved my children minister the gospel, and they're wonderful, upstanding people. Their grand- our grandchildren are yet to be decided, but we're, headed, we're hopefully headed in the right direction with them. And I'm just saying to you, there's, that's generational transfer. Yeah, yeah. At some point, some generation can say, I stopped the curse. 
The curse ends right here. Right now. No more of this. And then from then the, the generations that follow are blessed instead of cursed. Now, God doesn't curse anybody. I want you to know that. It's that you curse yourself by the choices that you make. So how do you stop the hurt legacy and begin a legacy of blessing? Well, there are two efforts that are involved here. And this is the first one. This first thing you must do, all right? There are only, there are only two efforts here, so okay. <laughs> They'll be quick for you. Number one, you must make peace with your family's past. You lived in it. Did you get hurt? Were you abused? Did you suffer? Did it affect you? How did it affect you? First, number one, if I'm going to change the hurt legacy of my life and I'm not going to pass it to my children or grandchildren, the first thing I have to do is I have to deal with, with my family's past. We just read a couple of verses from Deuteronomy chapter 5 about generational connection. Now, now, let's just go one more chapter over to Genesis chapter 6, and the Lord gives us some instructions about the responsibilities of being a parent, all right? And here it is. And I've underlined some things <laughs> to help. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Number one, number two, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. All right, get them in your heart. This is not just something you talk. This is something that has to be in you. See, you, you, you gotta love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength, and, and then these words that he's about to say to you, you're gonna have to get these words in your heart, and then you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. What he's describing there are the times in our life that are less stressed, more relaxed, and, 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 and contemplative. You know, I mean, uh, there's not uh, uh, distractions going on. And he just says, look, you get these things in your heart. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and then you get these words in you and let them be in your heart so that you can talk to them freely. You can, they, can, they can come out of you freely. And then when you're riding along in the car with your children, talk to them about these things. When you're, when you're sitting at the house on the couch and everybody just had supper, uh, just sit around and, and, and share some of these things with, with your children. Before they go to bed at night, go in their bedroom, kneel down beside their bed, and talk to them some about these things that are in your heart. And when you get up in the morning before you eat breakfast, say, hey guys, let me just, uh, let's look at this just a second. And you, then you just, you just put it before them. In other words, when, when life is not helter-skelter and stress is not bombing down on you and you don't have a bunch of stuff going on, take opportunity at that time to place these words into your children. Now, there are two commandments here. I know you see them. One commandment is, you shall love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That verse is saying, you are not prepared to be a parent if you don't know God. It's saying, you will never be able to lead your family to the purpose God has called them to and designed them to be if you don't have a dependency on the Lord and you're not a godly parent. And here's why. Genesis 1. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion, blah, blah, blah. So God creates man in his image and then he commands man to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth. In other words, God puts his 
image inside of us. And then he said, now you go out there and fill the earth up with people just like you who have my image on the inside of them. You be my image bearer. You Listen, as, as parents, you know what we are? We are image bearers of the character of God to our children. And the number one responsibility of a parent is to demonstrate for their child the character of God. So if you don't have the character of God, you can't complete your number one responsibility in this world. Bear my image. Now God knows we're not perfect. No parent is perfect. So God, that's why he says, you gotta love me with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength because you're gonna need some help in this. And I'm gonna help you. And I'm gonna be with you. And if you love me, we're gonna go do this together because God knows we need help. That's the first commandment. The second commandment is, take these words and you shall teach them diligently diligently to your children. Second commandment is, it's your responsibility to teach your children. I would, can you say that just looking at, at me? Don't look at each other because I don't want you to spray any corona on anybody. <laughs> say, it's my responsibility. God just said, it's my responsibility. Did it, did it, isn't that what he said? And you shall teach them diligently to your children. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul in verse 4 says this, and you fathers, and you know why he's talking to fathers? Because fathers is our responsibility. He didn't mean to say fathers and mothers. If he did, he would have said it. He said, and you fathers, it is your responsibility to make sure your family is taught the right things. Because you are the, not only taught the right things, but everything about your house is right. It's fathers, it's your responsibility and, 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 and to be the protector, the provider, and the priest of the family. Now, it doesn't mean mom can't help, and it doesn't mean you can't get other people to help, but it means it's your responsibility to make sure it happens right, is really what he said. And you fathers, notice it says, and you fathers do not provoke, <laughs> do not provoke your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, the loving instruction and discipline of the Lord. So I'm not to, I'm not to provoke my children to wrath. That's the main thought here, Dad. You gotta teach them right. You gotta teach them the right things. You gotta make sure that they grow up straight and not bent. It's your responsibility, and you got to do it without provoking them to wrath. So what provokes a child to wrath? When you yell at them, when you fuss at them, when you bark at them without showing them how to do things. Like, you expect them to just by osmosis, know how to do everything they do, and when they don't do it, then you bark, 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 bark chew, bark, 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 just tear them up, and, and you don't teach them anything. The psychologist calls that non-relational parenting. Non-relational parenting will bend your child, I'm telling you that, and will provoke your child to wrath. So, so we are responsible to diligently and patiently teach our children the way to do things. How do you do that? What do I need to think about, Dad? How can I do that? What am I supposed to do first? Remember, Deuteronomy 6 says, you got to do it when you when you when you driving down the street, you know, walking in the way, when you when you uh, sitting down, when you getting up, you know, I mean, you got a, you got a, some responsibilities. So take those non-stress reflective times and teach your children. Now, what this means is, it's not the church's responsibility to teach and educate your children. It's not the school's responsibility to teach and educate your children. It's your responsibility. Now, we can come alongside you and help 
and the schools can come alongside you and kind of partner up. But God says it's, it's our, I mean, I'm a, I'm a parent and grandparent. It's our responsibility not to let the TV rear our children, not to let the computers rear our children, not to let somebody else rear our children. We, we, we rear them. And don't trust them with a smartphone. And don't trust them with a computer. And if they ask, Dad, you don't trust me. I say, of course I don't. <laughs> You're a kid. You're being tempted. Come over here and let me smell your breath. You know, look me right in the eyes. Here, here, go urinate in that. And, uh, you know, and, and check them out. I mean, do everything three, three or four times. You know why? Because this world we are living in is evil. It is pure evil. And you got to check them out. <laughs> you, 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 they won't mind if you check them out like that, if you love them like Deuteronomy 6 says you're supposed to love them, right? I mean, if you talk with them in the way and you talk with them when they rise up and talk with them when they go down and, you're, and, you're, and you're, you, you admonish them and you train them and you're consistent and you're working with them, they're not going to mind if you give them the, you know, give them a, a frisk down almost because they know that you love them and you care about them. But if you just expect all of that out of them and don't ever train them or teach them or love them or show them, you're going to provoke them to wrath. So we got to carefully monitor everything that comes into our children's lives because this world is filling them with evil. So, and, and don't get overwhelmed. I mean, there's no perfect parents, like I said before, and we all need the Lord. And we all miss the Lord in some way. I guarantee you we have. And when we did, it created a bent, an iniquity. I'll guarantee you there's not one person in this room that doesn't have to have an iniquity to deal with or more. You say, uh, look, let put, up, Tanya, put up the iniquities on the screen. The, these are just some common iniquities. This obviously is not a full list. But look, this is what I'm talking about. Anger. Your, your family? Was, did somebody in your family just blow up with anger? Intimidate everybody? Cuss everybody? And, uh, you were scared to talk to them about things? That bent you. You're going to do that. Or be, or be uh, more apt to do it. Uh, chauvinism. Sexism. Racism. Bigotry, physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, substance abuse, immorality, pride, negativity, dishonesty, materialism, perfectionism, divorce, gossip, greed, control. You're a control freak. Somebody went family was a control freak. Control everybody. You got bent. Intimidation, conditional love. Mommy will love you if you do this. Uh, that's conditional love. Uh, performance motivation. Hey, you do this, I'll take you down and get some ice cream. I mean, you know, motivate you by, by, by performance. That's a bent. That'll create a bend in your life. Those are iniquities. So how do you handle iniquities in your life? Well, well let me just ask you. Let me, let me do this because I wrote down some questions. And I, because I, I thought maybe some of you might be wondering if you had an iniquity. So let me just ask you a few questions, all right? Just, just three or four questions, four or five were the things that you were exposed to as you were growing up biblically sound and morally correct? Second question, was your family a godly family? Third question, the way people in your family resolved conflict, was it right? How did your family handle money? How did your family treat others? What kind of attitude did they have about the opposite sex? few questions. Do you practice the same things you disagreed with or didn't like about your parents? See, this is the terrible thing about iniquities. The very things that we hated about our parents, that might be a too strong word, 
that we disagreed with, that our parents did, are the very things that we find ourselves doing. We were disgusted by it. We were ashamed of it. We got angry about it. And yet, here we find ourselves being just like them. That's iniquity. That's a bent. So how do you deal with iniquity? How do you get rid of it? Number one, first, admit it and take responsibility for it. Regardless of how you got it, it's your issue now. Call it what it is. Look at it in your own life. Quit trying to excuse it and just call it what it is. It, uh, if it's negativity, if it's pride, if it's substance abuse, uh, anger, whatever it is, this is my family and I realize I have that tendency and I take responsibility for my own actions and I know this has to change. God, change me. Admit it and take responsibility. Number two, forgive your parents. Now I'm gonna tell you, this thing of forgiveness is the mother of all issues dealing with your past. You will not be delivered from your past if you cannot forgive. It's killing you. You are the one that's being killed. If you can't forgive, you know what it does? It's like, a, it's like an imaginary umbilical cord that comes from your parents to you. They can even be dead and you still attach to them and attach to the event that you won't forgive in life. Look, give them some grace. God gives you grace. God gives you mercy. Give them grace and mercy. Pray and forgive. Say, God, it killed me. It doesn't mean it was right. You're not saying they were right. You were just saying, God, I am, I am refusing to hold this against my parents any longer. I want to be delivered from this. God is killing me. It's destroying my life. So God, break this bondage away from me. I forgive my parents. Give me the grace to forgive. God, I give them mercy. You, you gave me mercy. You gave me grace. I failed a bunch of times. And so God, I'm going to give them grace and mercy. And if you can't do that, you're always going to be controlled by your past. In any, in any area of the past, forgiveness is the mother of all issues. Number three, surrender that, that bent to the lordship of Jesus Christ. The way we get bent in the first place is disobedience and rebellion, right? To be proud and stubborn. <laughs> so in order to break that off of me, I, 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 I have to come before the Lord and say, Lord, you are the God of my life. You are the master of my life. And this thing, this thing that's controlling my life that's been passed down, I surrender that to you. And I'm not, I, I'm not gonna be stubborn and I'm not gonna be proud and I'm, not, and I'm gonna bring this thing out in the light and God forgive me for that. And number four, break that stronghold in the name of Jesus. And understand when you break that stronghold off of your life that you're breaking it off of your children, you're breaking it off of your grandchildren and all of those following generations. Instead of the generations of my family being a continuation of what those generations were before, when I came before God and said, God, break this off of me. I give this to you. Now the generations that follow are followed with godly ministry, with capable people, with responsible people, educated people, people that give to society, people that rear good children, people that have a positive life, people that are going somewhere. Yeah, break the curse is the deal. You got to break that thing off and it has to be a decision that you make all of these iniquities in right here, God. So that's the first effort that you have to make in creating a blessed legacy for those to come. And let me give you this other one real quick because I know I'm, I'm always skating on time. So number two, all right, remember the first, you got to make peace with your family's past. All right, here's the second one. You must make peace with yourself. All right? <laughs> Making peace with yourself. And, th and this deals with inner vows. How many of you have ever heard of inner vows? You've heard the words inner vows? Well, what are they? Well, 
for all practical purposes, an inner vow is the exact opposite of an iniquity. An iniquity is something that gets placed on you by your family, by your generations that come before you. An inner vow is, is a promise that you make yourself during an unpleasant experience or a hurtful time. And you do this in order to comfort yourself. An inner vow uh, would be something like this. I am never going to treat my children like that. I'll never spank my children. I'll never make my children wear hand-me-downs. I'll never make my children work like this. I'll never be poor again. There's a good one. I'm never going to be poor again. No one's ever going to hurt me like that again. I'll never let my husband or my wife treat me like that. And on and on and on. And you don't mean these to be bad for you. The, you like I said, you say them to yourself in order to comfort yourself. To say... Uh, this is never going to, I'm never going to be back here again. I'm, I, I'm never going to let this happen to me again. This is, this is just, I, I'm, I, I'll never get in this situation again. And, and that's an inner vow. So you're making yourself a promise that whatever it is that hurts you is never going to hurt you again. And, and you're not thinking that this is a bad thing, but let me show you why it's bad. Number one, it's unscriptural. In Matthew Chapters 5, look at what the Word says here. This is Jesus speaking. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. You shall, uh, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair black or white. And he should have said, or stay in. <laughs> but let your yes be yes and your no be no. And look at the last line. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? You go around swearing, and you're just swearing to anyone, even yourself. If you do that, Jesus says, that is evil. Why is an inner vow evil? Because when you make yourself an inner vow, you become Lord of the area that you vowed in and Jesus Christ is no longer Lord of that area of your life. You grow up in poverty, and you make the vow, well, I'm never going to be poor. Guess what part of your life is not under the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Your finances are now under your control. You said, I'm never going to let myself be poor again. So you just took over your finances and said, Jesus, I can handle this. And you are in charge of your finances. No one's ever going to hurt me like this again. Guess what part of your life is not under the lordship of Jesus Christ? Your relationships. You just said, Jesus, I'll handle my relationships because I'm not going to ever let myself get hurt like that again. And you can take the rest of it. It's unscriptural. Second, inner vows cause us to overreact and become unteachable. When I make myself an inner vow, I'll tell you what happens. You become unapproachable in that area. You become unteachable in that area and just a little bit crazy. And let me illustrate what I mean. I had a pastor share this. He said that he had some members in his church, wonderful people, Great people, kind, just generous, beautiful people. And they invited he and his wife to come over and eat supper, and so they did. And when they got into the house, the husband of the house um, said, hey, would you like a drink? And, uh, 
he said, yeah, uh, you know, give me a root beer or something, whatever. And, um, and so the, the husband went and got it, you know, and he poured it in the glass and, and he took care of everybody else's soda or drink. And, uh, and, and it, he, it, the guy and the pastor said, you know, I kept, every time you take a sip or two out of it, man, he'd refill it. He said, I've never seen somebody so eager and so, uh, <laughs> you know, and so aggressive about refilling the, the glass, you know. And, and later after the meal, the, the husband called pastor over and, and opened up the cabinets in his, in his kitchen. And pastor said, I have never seen so many soft drinks uh, in one place outside of a grocery store in my entire life. He said, those cabinets were filled with soft drinks. And so he got the wife, you know, later on, got the wife kind of away. Then they were looking and he said, what, what's, the, what's the deal with, this, with all these drinks, you know? She said, well, she said, when my husband was growing up, his mother would not allow soda in their house. And all of his friends that came over to visit him never got any soda. They only had to drink water maybe a tea at time, but no soft drinks. And he said to his mama one day, he said, Mama, when I get my own place, I am going to put a soda machine right in the middle of the living room, and it's going to stay full, and nobody's going to have to pay for one. You just walk up there and press the button, and there, there it comes out of there. But I am never going to be without soda when I get my own place. Now, does anybody recognize an interval here? <laughs> All right, so he and his wife, the husband and his wife were going down a grocery store aisle and they came to the sodas and the husband starts filling the buggy up with sodas. I mean, just loading her down and the wife said, that's enough. And he turned around and looked at her and said, don't you tell me that's enough. I'll have as many of these sodas as I want to. And she said, whoa, look who's a little crazy. You know? Well, that's what an inner vow will do. It, it, it causes us to react. It, the nicest guy in the world, the most pleasant person in the world, but when it came to soft drinks, he was just a little cray-cray, you know. It just, that's inner vows. And as I mentioned, they're pretty much opposite of iniquity. And when you see your family operating in iniquity, it, 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 you get a little bent and you have the tendency to act the same way they act. But when you have an inner vow operating, it's, kind of, it, it, it's sort of like uh, a drunk man trying to, trying to mount a horse. Have you ever seen a drunk person try to get on a horse? Well, be still. <laughs> finally throws over goes all the way over to the other side <laughs> can't stay on a horse now with iniquities and intervals what's going on in family's life is like your family's over there in the ditch cause they're full, of, they're full of iniquities and you out in the middle of the road like a drunk man getting on a horse cause you're full of intervals and you can't get on, you know, on, and when you fall off the horse, you point over there to your family and say, well, at least I'm not in the ditch. But you're not on the horse either. And nobody can get on the horse. Nobody can ride the horse. Nobody can be fulfilled. Nobody can go in any positive direction at all. And no generation makes any progress because it's iniquity interval. Iniquity interval. Reaction, 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 reaction. And that's the legacy of your family. Somebody has to break that cycle. How do you break intervals? Number one, recognize them. When did you make that self your promise? That promise, what kind of trauma in your life was going on? You didn't turn it to God. Look, when you got hurt, God says, give it to me. You didn't give it to me. You didn't give it to him. You gave it to yourself. And that's sin. And so you got to recognize that and say, God, I had no right to take control of my life in that area. So God, forgive me for this. I repent of this. Do you know what repent means? Repent means 
to change your mind and then change your actions. It means about face, like that. That's what the word repent means. So you repent of that, and you say, God, I made myself a promise, and I'm giving it up now. Secondly, you forgive. Getting ready to enter vows. I told you it was the mother of all issues of the past. Whoever did whatever to you, that individual that caused you that pain, you must forgive them in order to be set free. Number three, submit that area to Jesus. Lord, I said that I'd never be poor again. Now I'm obsessed with money. Now I'm a materialist. Now I can't give like I'm supposed to. I can't have compassion in my giving because you're not the Lord of that area of my life. And I surrender that area of my life to you and ask you to cleanse me of that inner vow and forgive me for taking responsibility for it in my own life. Submit it to Jesus. One other verse. I'm quitting, I promise you. Proverbs 13, 22. I just want you to see this. Look at what it says. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Now, who, who are your children's children? Your grandchildren, right? A good man, see, you see what this said? A good man leaves an inheritance not only to his children, but to his grandchildren. <laughs> He says, I don't want, I, I'm not simply caring that I bless my children. I want to bless my children's children, my grandchildren, with an inheritance of my life. And I'm just saying that that hurt locker that we have stuff stuffed down into not only affects our life, it affects our generations that follow us. And you have been affected by the generations that have come before you. And I would be totally shocked if everybody in here didn't have to deal with some inner vow or some iniquity. Yeah, yeah. Because this all, I, I don't even, I, I don't know if it's possible to live a life with no iniquities and no inner vows. But they're dangerous and, they, and they're harmful. And they keep our generations dysfunctional. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to pass any more dysfunctionality to my kid. <laughs> more than they already have, you know. So I'm going to ask the Lord for that. All right, bow your head with me just a second. Let me...